I mean, I started my research career in the Arctic in 1981, so I'm now 30 plus years working in the Arctic. And over my career, which is quite remarkable, I've seen a change in the sea ice environment to go from the Arctic basin covered with 85% of it was multi-year sea ice. Now, multi-year sea ice is that stuff that survives a summer and then goes to grow the next year and then survives the next summer. And that was typical of what we saw in the high Arctic basin. We're now down to 12% of the Arctic basin covered with that kind of ice. And that has had huge implications throughout the system. Matter of fact, we don't see anything that isn't affected by that. So we went from something that had an average thickness of, you know, between five and 10 meters to something that has an average thickness between one and two meters. And so it's a very remarkable shift. Now that's affecting things in very complex ways. So we get involved with all of that kind of stuff. Like there's new forms of, uh, or there's new species showing up in the Arctic. So the the Atlantic, some of the species are starting to move into the Arctic and displacing the Arctic species. Same in the Pacific is happening on that side. Polar bears are a good one. People think about polar bears all the time as, well, we're losing this sea ice, so that means polar bear habitat is disappearing. But in fact, it's much more complicated than that because the polar bears never used to use multi-year sea ice. They prefer first-year sea ice. So if it used to be dominated by multi-year sea ice, now it's dominated by first-year sea ice, it's actually improving habitat in some areas. The length of open water season is what's really affecting them. So populations like Hudson Bay and the populations that are more southerly latitudes, they have to deal with more longer open water periods where they can't go out and forage for seals. I think on the technological front, we now have tools available to us that we never had before. We can look at very complex things in the environment. And in our lab here, for instance, to give you an example, we start our studies at the, at the nanometer scale like very, very minute, tiny kinds of scales. The kinds of instruments you see in this lab are able to do that kind of research. And we go all the way up to looking at the uh, Arctic from space. And we understand all those different interconnections because of the tools we have. These tools allow us to do that kind of thing. And then major investments like CMO, it, you know, that's a major investment. It's a $32 million research infrastructure, which is globally unique, which will really catapult our research. The same could be said for the Amundsen. Before the Amundsen came along, we were always restricted to just ships of opportunity in Canada. Now we have our own dedicated research icebreaker. So when you can take 40 scientists, put them all in the same place, and get them all to do their science all simultaneously in the same location, you learn a tremendous amount. So it's very expensive work we do, but it's um, very important work too, because we need to understand our planet and where we're going in terms of our change in global climate.